Undertale is one of my favorite games. Not because it has extremely creative, personable characters. Not because it has an incredible narrative. Not because it challenges all of the player's preconceptions about games as a whole. It's because it gave us the multicolor tile puzzle. It's the one thing that keeps me coming back after all these years. If you're wondering, what is the multicolor tile puzzle, then you need to go play Undertale. But if you're okay with minor spoilers for a game that's already older than your grandchildren, you can keep watching this video. It's basically a gag. You meet a skeleton that has an affinity for crude, easy-to-solve puzzles. Most of them you can solve with one glance. But this one's different. You're faced with a menacing disco floor, and he explains the rules of the puzzle, which are only slightly more complicated than Lord of the Rings lore. Then you're told it will be completely randomly generated. No living being will know the solution. In grave anticipation, you prepare for the worst challenge of your life. Until you realize that the maze generator placed all the tiles with Bogosort. A rush of emotions and feelings went through every player's mind at this point. I sure am glad I didn't have to do that. But what if I did? What would it be like if that was real? About three hours later, the game answers a lot of those questions by presenting you with an actual tile puzzle. Oh shit. It also doesn't repeat any of the rules. Oh fuck. It even gives you a time limit. When the timer expires, there's an intervention, and then the game proceeds like normal. So... Yet again, the puzzle was just a gag, and not something you were meant to solve. However, the community quickly realized that the maze is solvable, in which case the game gives you new, charming dialogue. On the other hand, though, it's not randomly generated. It's the same maze on every playthrough. And that's the last mention of it. I immediately craved more. I wanted randomly generated tile puzzles to be a real thing. And I wasn't alone. Way back in 2015, I searched Google, and someone had already done it. I was almost disappointed that I didn't get to do it myself. But whatever, it saved me the trouble. I excitedly clicked on the top result, and it worked! The tile maze was fully implemented. It did have a word of caution, though. Large mazes would take a very long time to load. Okay, well, I had a little fun with the smaller maze sizes, but they were too easy. I wanted a real challenge. So one day, I asked it to generate a larger one before leaving for school for the day. I figured it would be done by the time I got home. What actually happened was, I forgot about it and checked on it two days later. And it still wasn't done! That's when I realized. It would generate a maze 100% randomly, check if it was solvable, and if not, keep generating new mazes until it found a solvable one. Then it would give that to the player. I don't know who else needs to hear this right now, but it's actually really hard to accidentally make a solvable tile puzzle. In 2015, I was barely in high school. I wasn't a skilled enough code weaver to solve this problem on my own. So I waited. I'd theorize here and there while at school. I tried to develop an algorithm. I just couldn't quite get there. So I waited. And I forgot. The year is 2022. I was cleaning the house at my landlord's stern request when I discovered this. It's a scratch paper from 2015. It's incomplete, but it lists some ideas that I'd already long forgotten. I didn't want to forget again. I wanted to do it justice. In order to implement the rainbow maze, as I like to call it, we have to review the rules. And absolutely nobody tells them better than Papyrus himself. Each color has a different function. Red tiles are impassable. You cannot walk on them. Yellow tiles are electric. They will electrocute you. Green tiles are alarm tiles. If you step on them, you will have to fight a monster. Orange tiles are orange scented. They will make you smell delicious. Blue tiles are water tiles. Swim through if you like, but if you smell like oranges, the piranhas will bite you. 
Also, if a blue tile is next to a yellow tile, the water will also zap you. Purple tiles are slippery. You will slide to the next tile. However, the slippery soap smells like lemons, which piranhas do not like. Purple and blue are okay. Finally, pink tiles. They don't do anything. Step on them all you like. Sounds like a crossword puzzle from hell. It's not immediately clear that this will even be any fun, or pose any reasonable challenge, but... Undertale planted the seed, and it's time for us to water it. We need to make these rules more digestible. There's seven kinds of tile, and I decided to categorize them into safe tiles and unsafe tiles. The safe tiles include pink, orange, purple, green, and blue. The unsafe tiles include yellow and red. But wait a minute, blue isn't always safe. It shocks you if it's touching a yellow tile, and it bites you if you smell like oranges. And what the hell do we do about green tiles? Undertale is an RPG with a turn-based combat system, and that's what Papyrus means by fighting a monster if you step on one. We don't want to add a whole combat simulation, or at least I don't. But here's my rationale. You want to avoid green tiles if you can help it, but you're allowed to step on them, and sometimes required to step on them. So they're safe. I had several ideas on how to treat green tiles, including adding a health system, summoning threats to the maze itself, making them do absolutely nothing. Ultimately what I did was I added a score system, and stepping on a green tile adds one point. Ideally, you solve the maze with as few points as possible, like golf. I think this captures the spirit well. Anyway, there's a couple other quirks that we have to recreate faithfully. Question. Besides the fact that yellow can shock neighboring blue tiles, what is the functional difference between yellow and red? You might be tempted to say nothing, because you can't pass through either of them. But the one tile puzzle in Undertale gives us some insight. Red acts like a wall that you can't even try to step on. Yellow, on the other hand, lets you get a few steps in before shocking you and sending you back to the tile from whence you came. Big deal, right? But if that tile is purple, you keep sliding backwards. Blue tiles also behave this way when electrified and when the piranhas bite you. This is much different from sliding into a red tile where you are stopped cold. We could write the game logic first and write the random generator later, but without a random generator, how do we get mazes to playtest? So I wrote the random generator first. What's the trick to making a random maze generator that always generates solvable puzzles? You have to generate the solution first, and then fill in the rest. And this is the first place I got stuck, which makes sense as I hadn't written any code yet. What do we do about blue tiles if they're not always safe? First, the solution generator has to keep track of the flavor. Turns out this isn't just game logic, it's puzzle maker logic. If the last tile placed was orange, then we can't place a blue tile, or the path won't be solvable. We actually can't place a blue tile until we've placed a purple tile, so we use a variable to keep track of that. I decided to make the solution generator start from the left, at a random height, and move in a random direction, placing safe tiles until it reached the right side. Excellent. My first crash. I told it not to overwrite tiles that it had already placed, because that seems wasteful. Well, the solution path would snag on itself, since it can move in any direction as it goes. Fair enough. It was time to introduce some new code. If going to snag... Don't. It turns out that this is not very trivial. Sure, we can tell it to pick a different direction if there's already a tile where it wanted to go, but it can tron itself pretty easily. I had to make the immensely difficult decision to allow the solution path to overwrite itself. It wouldn't crash anymore, but there was another problem. The solution paths were really thick and blotchy. That's what you get with purely random movement. Plus, it has to get to the right end of the maze, so purely random movement isn't exactly what we want. We need random waiting. 
I gave it a 40% chance of moving right, a 25% chance to go up or down respectively, and a 10% chance to go backwards, left. This worked pretty well. The paths were a little too straight, but I decided to come back to that later. Once the solution path is generated, it's time to fill in the rest of the maze with random tiles, safe and unsafe. This is easy, it's just a for loop. We check if the tile is empty, and if so, we place a random color. And this produced... underwhelming results. See the problem? I'll explain it like this. Imagine a maze four blocks tall, which, by the way, is the height of the actual puzzle in Undertale. And to keep things simple, let's say the solution path is a straight line. So, this is already 25% of the tiles. If unsafe tiles are only allowed in the remaining 75% of the maze, that means there are disproportionately less of them. It's harder to notice in taller mazes, but I wasn't satisfied. When filling outside the solution path, we need to slightly weight unsafe tiles, while still allowing safe tiles to be generated, otherwise you get a bridge. I did something very convenient for myself here. I'd given each tile an ID number, and I ordered them from safest to least safe. So, I just added a random offset to make unsafe tiles more likely. I chose an offset of 0 to 2, because there's only two unsafe tiles, and I left it at that because I liked the results. At this point, however, I got curious about the actual distribution of tiles in the maze featured in Undertale, and I'd completely forgotten that I'd already compiled that data back in 2015. I wanted to make a maze editor anyway, because obviously people would want to recreate the maze from Undertale, so now seemed like a good time to implement it, so that I could use it to recreate the maze from Undertale. There's not much to say about the editor itself, but this is also when I had to come up with a scheme for level codes, to make them shareable. I wanted them to fit in the URL as a query parameter, which meant they had to be URL friendly, so I settled on a modified Base64 scheme. There's 10 numbers, plus the 26 letter alphabet, times 2 for uppercase and lowercase letters, and that's 62 possible characters. Throw in two more, and every character can represent one of 64 values, which maps nicely to six binary bits. The extra two characters are usually a forward slash and a plus sign, but these don't play as nice in URLs, so I used hyphens and underscores instead. Most Base64 encoding schemes are concerned with packing and unpacking 8-bit values across 6-bit characters, but this was already perfect for me. With seven colors, every tile could be represented with three bits, meaning an even two tiles per character. I even had room for an eighth kind of tile, which I decided should be the start and finish tile. I made it plaid. Did you know Papyrus actually mentions plaid tiles? One extra character is prepended to every level code to represent the height, which means one of these mazes can be no taller than 64 blocks, but the width is unlimited. It's calculated by dividing the total by the height. Now, let's say we take the maximum height of 64 and make the maze twice as wide. Now that's a challenge. But that's also a 4097 character level code. That won't fit in a Discord message, even if you use Nitro. So I'd have to add smaller share codes. Ever wondered how a link shortener website works? It's basically a hashing function. Long string goes in, shorter index comes out, then stringified. To keep things very simple, I decided to generate the hashes randomly and stuff them in a database. Then the game asks the server to do a lookup. Wow, that actually worked. By this point, I was ready to code the game itself. There were a few loose ends with the maze generator, but we might explore them more easily by playing through the mazes and testing them directly. Given how complicated the rules actually are, plus all the nuances discussed earlier, I was expecting this to be really hard. It was not. I've never written more elegant code in my life. When you sit down to write code for player movement, it's tempting to say, okay, we can move in four directions. So here's the code for moving up, and then there's the code for moving left, and then the code for moving right, and then down. Here's a lesson for the aspiring programmers. If you're ever writing similar code over and over, there's a better way to do it. 
In my case, I wrote one function, move, which takes a coordinate offset, a vector if you want to get spicy, adds that to the player's coordinates, and then checks what tile is there. Landing on orange and purple tiles changes the player's flavor, landing on a purple tile calls the function again in the same direction, and landing on a yellow or unsafe blue tile calls the function again in the opposite direction. And that's it. So now it's back to the more complicated stuff. See, there are a couple problems left with our random generator. The most obvious one is that yellow tiles can be placed next to blue solution tiles, rendering them impassable. What I did to process electricity is, I actually made a ninth tile, blue but electrified, and I wrote a function to check every yellow tile's neighbors and replace all contiguous blue tiles with elect tiles. A flood fill algorithm, basically. It's not as efficient, but an easy way to prevent the maze from becoming unsolvable is by running the opposite of this on every blue tile on the solution path, and then replacing any touching yellow tiles with a random, non-yellow tile. In order to do this, we have to remember which tiles belonged to the solution path, so the solution generator stores those tiles in an array, which the randomizer checks back on later. After playtesting several mazes, I ran into another, unexpected problem. The player cannot turn on purple tiles because they're slippery, but as it stands, the solution path can turn at any time, which can make the path untraversable if the player is forced to slide into a yellow or blue tile. I didn't want to restrict purple tiles too much, so I spent some time writing code that would calculate whether the solution path turned on a purple tile, and calculate where to put a red tile that the player could rest against. But then I got a maze where red tiles boxed me in at the very start. So the solution path may no longer turn on purple tiles. But there's one last thing that bugged me. The solution paths were too straight. We needed to make them gayer. What good is a square maze if you're always going to cut across the middle? I wanted something that would take long trips upward and downward. Something wavier. Something that would really clear my sinuses. A sine wave. By plugging the x-coordinate and some random numbers into a sine function, we get something far more convincing. The exact formula took some trial and error, and to be honest, I don't know how exactly it works. But I stopped when I felt comfortable with the results. Sometimes the paths look a little too rigid, but don't forget, once the rest of the maze is filled in with random tiles, a more organic solution usually emerges. With this, I was finally satisfied. Seven years after the release of Undertale, I can now confidently say that at least one decent implementation of the multicolor tile puzzle exists. Of course, I still had a shit ton of work to do. UI, controls, bug fixing, graphics, sound, polish. Polish? Polish. But it made for some grade A commit messages. I made time to add a few Easter eggs as well, but those are for you to discover. What's next? You can go to the Git repository and see for yourself. But the game is done. It's playable, and it's live. I don't use Twitter, so someone's gonna have to tell Toby Fox on my behalf. Thanks for watching, and if you haven't played my Rainbow Maze yet, go give it a try. I promise you're gonna have a good time.